to big. Hulk, would you move your big head out of the mic? I want you to look at the difference between Rosie's ring and her. Just in case, hey, Rosie's is a little bit bigger. I'm a smart guy. See ya. But like most marriages, this will be a platonic one. Tom and Roseanne whip up a rumor blitz about a three-way marriage. Whoopi Goldberg puts rumors to rest. And Entertainment Tonight turns the tables on Murphy Brown from Monday, December 6, 1993. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Entertainment Tonight. I'm John Tesh here in Hollywood. Mary? Hello there, John. I'm in New York City, and I'm Mary Hart. Well, Tom and Roseanne Arnold shocked even the tabloids last week with their announced plans for a three-way marriage. They were with the new bride-to-be last night when E.T. cameras went in rolling to get to the bottom of the story. I love that it's like a bigger, it's a, a more shocking story than Michael Jackson sleeping with 13-year-old boys. So you've heard the hype. Mr. and Mrs. Arnold planned to marry a female employee rumored to be having an affair with Tom. Last night, they came clean, admitting the mock wedding and engagement ring given to assistant Kim Silver are just to poke fun at those who started the rumors of infidelity. Any statements we gave to the press, I did them in tongue-in-cheek completely. It was obvious if you read them. If they want to believe it, you know, they can believe whatever they want. Part of the reason they fessed up is the unflattering spotlight shining on the, quote, other woman, who for the first time revealed her reaction. Kim, how are you handling all the, the publicity and so forth, all the rumors, the gossip? I don't know. I'm not doing anything. What about your mom? Your mom's still mad, isn't she? She's not speaking to anyone. She's not speaking, but your dad thinks it's pretty funny, am I right? Yeah, Lou thinks it's great. What about the, your friends back in New Jersey? My friends are and back in New Jersey are celebrities now. Everybody's calling everyone. So it's kind of fun. It's been pretty fun, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, we love you. Pick it up with your hands, man. Forget the fork. The Arnolds set the record straight at a celebrity eat-off at Planet Hollywood, which raised over a million dollars for their foundation benefiting sexually abused kids. Their next event? Continuing the joke with the first annual Arnold threesome wedding next weekend. We just love weddings. We love weddings and, uh, and graduations and bar mitzvahs and things like that where you can have like a big party. So yeah, we'll probably do it every year. We may marry a different person every year too. We're taking applications for the mail now. Here are the wedding plans to this hour. Tom and Roseanne will renew their vows next weekend in a shopping mall in Minneapolis. And then later in a private ceremony, they will continue with the hoax and say their I do's with Kim. Of course, we'll have a full report on the honeymoon. With Whoopi Goldberg, the operative word is big. Big movies, big headlines, big romance, big controversy. Lisa Gibbons landed this big exclusive to put everything Whoopi-wise into perfect focus. I got the flow, you all gotta go, so go get your bags so we can go. Ho, ho. Whoopi Goldberg is back in the habit again in Sister Act 2. Once again, she goes undercover as Sister Mary Clarence, this time trying to turn some street kids into a choir. But I've decided I'm gonna dog you no matter what. And as in the first Sister Act, Whoopi also shows us her own very unique Vegas lounge act. You look so fine in that cat suit. Yes. You give yes, Michelle yes. Pfeiffer a run for her money. Well, that was always the case anyway, <laughs> you know. Um, I guess the good news is now you're, you're viewed as a, as a, a more dimensional a woman. woman. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How about women, period? People moving in because of the color of the skin. Of course, while she was making Sister Act 2, Whoopi was constantly on the tabloid front pages. Her relationship with Ted Danson, his appearance in blackface at a Friars Club roast for her, and their subsequent breakup made Goldberg a constant media target. This is nothing new to me. But the, the, what's new is the maliciousness, this intensive not, need to know about my sex life, you know, and this, this insane frightening where they're like breaking into your house. You know, that's what killed our friendship. That's why our friendship is no longer theirs. You know, because the price for being friends became too much. So you're not even friends at this point? No, we're not. You're, because of the, the pr because external pressure, you're not able to even too communicate? too much, yeah, yeah. That is yeah. sad. This is America. While making the first Sister Act, Whoopi had some pretty well-known and heated battles with Disney, the studio that made the film. She didn't agree to do the sequel until the producers met one important criteria. I did this because they offered me a lot of money. 
And I waited Honest. until they had to offer me a lot of money. That was, I wanted them to. I wanted them to have to come to me. And now, why was that so important? Because I needed vindication. That point was made. It's also made me, you know, the highest paid woman in the history of film, which I enjoy also. How much did you get paid for this movie? A lot of money, baby. More money than any other woman. I'm really good. And, you know, Julia's back. Every movie's got her. But one thing will never change is that for a little while, I was the queen bee. And they can never take that away from her. Lisa Gibbons, Entertainment Tonight. Thank you, Lisa. The movie is a family affair of sorts. Whoopi's daughter, Alexandria, plays one of the kids in the choir. Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, opens coast to coast Friday. Mary? For six seasons now, Murphy Brown has been leading her FYI television magazine show staff looking for scoops and prying behind the scenes. E.T. felt it was high time to give FYI a taste of its own medicine and dig for dirt about Murphy Brown. Hi, I'm Joe Regalbuto. Welcome to the set of Murphy Brown. I want to just show you around, get you acquainted with uh, where we sort of hang out every day. Murphy Brown fans know him as the intrepid FYI reporter Frank Fontana, but it was just regular Joe who gave entertainment tonight an insider's tour of one of the most familiar sets on TV. Okay, now here we are in, in the famous Murphy Brown office. Some of these are actual uh, real magazine covers that Candace was on. Does that look like the real Pope to you? It's always so hard to tell. This is our beloved Candace Bergen. The woman is a very hard-working woman. However, Pick up the phone. What do we have here? Do I need to pick this up? Some would call it crib sheets. Some would call her a cheater. These are her lines. What are you talking about? What could this be? Nice cup of coffee, huh? <laughs> well, how about that? The octopus does qualify as a mall. I guess you were right, Frank. This is the uh, makeup room. This is the place where Faye yeah. Ford gets all of her... Her beauty is just... Well, she's got it naturally, but... She gets oh, all, yeah. Because the real... Faith Ford actually looks like this. I wanted to just point this out. <laughs> this is Charlie Kimbrough before his makeup job. This is Charlie after makeup. <laughs> Joe told us someone was defacing the makeup room cast photos. And most importantly, the artist here is, is also shown. You didn't know that she had this much hair, did you? Anyway. This is our makeup staff. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> Joe shared some other set secrets, actual crew names on the reporter assignment board. Candace's habit of chewing the sugar out of gum and leaving the remains behind. She saves the wrapper and very neat about it. She takes the chewed piece out, carefully rolls it up. Sugarless now, of course, so if anybody wants a piece of sugarless gum, we've got that for them too. Yeah, nice. And an elevator with two entrances that opens on the FYI bullpen. And out we go into our bullpen. <coughs> Say hi, crew. Hi, crew. Hi, guys. Yeah. I, I'm, in, I'm in love with you guys. I am crazy about this crew. Hit your mark, Joe. One last secret. Candace isn't the only one who writes down lines. So do Grant Shaw and Faith Ford. Oh, and, and this was another show after that. And, and yet still another. And sometimes I even label them by scene. <laughs> Anyway, guys, uh, thanks for coming on the set and having a little look. I gotta get off to work. Um, hope you enjoyed the tour. See you later. I've never seen that man before in my life. Kenny Rogers gives some kids a shot at the spotlight. That story is next on E.T. I've read your pretty speeches and I must admit they touched my heart. And a lost love song from Judy Garland. You'll get the first look in 48 years later on E.T. Mrs. Doubtfire ruled the roost at the box office for the second weekend in a row. A Perfect World was second. Adam's Family Values, The Three Musketeers, and Carlito's Way finished out the top five. In A Perfect World, Kevin Costner is a crook on the run with Clint Eastwood on his trail. But between these two movie giants is a three-foot-tall boy who's kid first, star second. I all pulled him! Oh, oh. His resume includes wrestling with his dog Stanley, a little karate, going to the local country club for bowling, yes, and hanging out at the 49th Street Galleria. Yes. 
So how did seven-year-old T.J. Lowther end up starring with two of the biggest names in the business, Clint Eastwood and Kevin Costner, in A Perfect World? You ever ridden in a time machine before? Well, sure you have. What do you think this is? A car. Maybe it's the effect he has on adults, like co-star Costner, who showed a silly side to T.J. He stuck cigarettes up his nose and pretended like he was a walrus. And uh, when I was scrap his, scratch his belly, he would go, ooh, ooh. And then when I would stop, he'd go, <laughs> T.J. and his parents, Brent and Libby, say his acting career came about by accident. Well, he was boasting that he had such a cute kid. <laughs> and That's true. So, and he was working for Susie McCarty. He's a private investigator, but he isn't that private anymore. What does that mean? <laughs> And I, that's true. And I told him I had a cute little boy and she has a modeling agency and she said, send a picture. We did. And they used him and put him in the book. TJ got commercials and some local film work in Utah. Then he played one of Kathy Bates' kids in A Home of Our Own. Look at that. Oh, look at all that space right there. Look. That film led to auditions for A Perfect World as the boy who was kidnapped by con man Costner. The next thing we know, we got a call saying, do you want to come meet the boys? And we said, oh, who are they? And they said, Kevin and Clint. So what kinds of things did T.J. talk to the boys about? He told them this story about his dog, Stanley. <laughs> Stanley would go down in my friend Alex Wilhelm's yard, and he would kind of do number one on the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Guess Clint liked yeah. the story. T.J. likes acting, but plans on staying in Utah and being a regular kid for a while. He really wants to go to the Air Force Academy and be a pilot. Still, he says he did like coming to Los Angeles for the premiere of A Perfect World. I liked it a lot, especially staying in the Five Star Hotel. Good meals. For his own preference, TJ says he doesn't like violent movies. In fact, he told us he'd like to star in a Christmas movie. Think over the rainbow and it's Judy Garland you see singing it. So what happened to the song My Intuition? Well, she sang it, but most people have never heard of it. Now Leonard Malton is going to give us a lesson in movie archaeology and a listen. Leonard. Yes, I am, Mary. Now, you know, year after year, people keep combing the studio film vaults and making discoveries. Latest example, the unearthing of some musical numbers that were shot, completed, then cut from some famous MGM musicals. What I'm about to show you hasn't been seen since a sneak preview audience watched it in 1946. A Judy Garland number deleted from her film, The Harvey Girls. Not as it was put together, but in its raw state right out of the camera. I've read your pretty speeches and I must admit they touched my heart. I don't know where you borrowed them, but most of them are works of art. The song is called My Intuition, and it's a lovely ballad that Judy sings with a little help from leading man John Hodiak. But the number didn't stay because it slowed up the picture. That's what the film's director, George Sidney, recalled when I watched it with him after 48 years' time. The only thing to consider is the acceptance of the audience and the success of the film, and what we might love for our personal reason a number that we staged or even wrote or this and that if it didn't help the picture out it would have to go even so I sydney can, has I vivid can. memories of filming and the number which for all its simplicity on screen can. involved a great but deal of work and planning we were probably out there for about things. three days because we had, it, it was western country as you can see well, which was all real we had to move, remove boulders we have to water it down and also I, you're not going to tell anybody about this, I hope. Oh, of course not. That greenery, of course, came from the MGM uh, greenery department. You're kidding. No, you have to, you, you know, the director says, hey, put a tree right there now, Charlie. Don't, 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 you know, give me that tree. No back talk. You've got your tree right there. As for Judy Garland, stories of her difficulties and breakdowns seem very distant from this moment in time. So though it may be bad advice, I guess I'll have to string along Until you prove my intuition can be wrong 
because Judy was amazing, she could just hear her own track once and just lip sync it perfectly. Judy, when you talk to her, seriously, she would just look off in the direction like this. You'd talk to her and say, oh, she's not hearing a word. She said, I'm ready. Saw it once, got in. Not alone did she hear everything you said, she could add more to it. She had that kind of quixotic talent. All of which makes it seem a shame that the song didn't remain I'll in the film. But at least it's been found, so we can savor it after its long stay on the shelf. Until we prove our intuitions can be wrong. I want to thank the folks at Turner Entertainment who recently restored the Harvey Girls and who provided us with that tantalizing number. And thank you, Leonard. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leonard. He named two of his four children Moon Unit and Dweezil and wrote songs like Don't Eat the Yellow Snow and Shake Your Booty. The outrageous and very talented Frank Zappa died Saturday of prostate cancer. He was 52. Zappa made music that couldn't be pigeonholed and had opinions that would not be stifled. Eat that pork, eat that ham. Laugh till you choke on Billy Frank Zappa's music was filled with biting social commentary, so it was no surprise in the mid-80s that he fought to keep warning labels off of records deemed by Tipper Gore and others to be unsuitable for children. He put on a suit and tie to testify at a congressional hearing. The PMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises... He also crusaded against some TV evangelists. They're trying to take the entire country back uh, to the point where it's almost Inquisition time again. And I don't see anybody uh, willing to stand up and uh, take a shot back at these guys. Started singing the blues, cause it thought it was man -like. Zappa prided himself on being an innovator. Even in the 60s, he was outside the rock and roll mainstream. Here he dispenses advice to Davy Jones of the Monkees in the 1968 movie, Head. Yeah, it doesn't leave much time for your music. You should spend more time on it because the youth of America depends on you to show the way. Yeah? Yeah. He poured a lot of money from his rock records into the staging of his more experimental, serious music. 